Hello, amazing parents and caretakers, and welcome to the Pumped Up Parenting Podcast. I'm your family empowerment coach, Celia Kibler. I'm a mom of a blended family of five kids. I'm a grandma of nine kids, an author, a teacher, a speaker, and a consultant with over 40 years of training and real life parenting experience. I'm here to offer you practical, doable tips, strategies, and techniques that will pump up your parenting skills and create peace, love, and laughter throughout your family. In addition, I'll be interviewing some great humans that are on a mission to make your life a better, happier, and healthier life. So let's not waste any time and get started with the next episode of the Pumped Up Parenting Podcast. Thanks for listening. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Pumped Up Parenting Podcast. I'm Celia Kibler, your host, and we are talking step parenting today. I personally have been a step parent for over 26 years, and my guest Amy has been a step parent for over 20 years. So we've got 46 years of being experienced step parents to talk about and help you be the best step parent you can be. So let me introduce you to my guest first. My guest today is Amy Stone, and she is a certified life coach, a mom, a stepmom, and a grandma. Amy is a self-proclaimed blended family expert who specializes in working with adults in blended families who want to reduce drama and go from chaos to calm in their homes. We have a lot in common. When she's not coaching, she's usually running or swimming or biking. Amy is a seven-time Ironman triathlon finisher and an avid marathon runner. Woohoo! I'm not even even sure I could start at that. (laughs) Yay for Amy. So she comes to us with a lot of energy, a lot of expertise between the two of us. We're going to help you. So Amy, welcome to the Pumped Up Parenting Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today and have this conversation. Yay. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to talk about this because step parents need a lot of help. And even though we're both step moms, what we're going to offer you today will also help you dads that are listening because step parenting can be a challenge, but it can be incredibly rewarding. My three stepsons, I, we are close, 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 like any mom and son would be. And uh, I think it is entirely possible if you put your mind to it and you apply certain different techniques that we're going to talk about today to help you guys out. So Amy, tell me what got you into this? What, I mean, I know you are a step parent like me, what got you into knowing that you could help other parents deal with the same situations? That's a really good question because the truth is that I definitely went through a pretty big period of doubt about that um, exploration of who was I even to offer my help or support and what did I have to offer? Could I really do it? Um, It's definitely a part of my lived experience. Uh, I lived my own challenges as someone who entered a blended family. I think in our pre-recording interview, you mentioned that you had an intentional plan when you went into blending your family. And I'm the opposite. I was 24 when I started dating a guy I turned out to marry um, just under 30 when we got married. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I did, but obviously I was too young. I had no experience. And so the challenges were definitely something that I lived through. Um, But then years later, when I was going through a career shift and some training, and I had this thought that maybe this is something that I could help people with, I definitely went through a period of doubt and wonder about whether or not I was that person and can do it. And that's one of the reasons I'm very clear about the fact that I'm a life coach. And what I offer people is a, um, an experience with someone who has lived my experience, which is not the same as anybody else's experience, right? Um, tools that come with life coaching that offer resources and support and in dealing with finding a way that you can be happy within your family, because that was a really, really big challenge for me. And it was quite a surprise as I went through it. Being content in your life is such a big part of everything. You know, I came to being a step parent. I was already a parent. I had two children with my first husband. 
my kids were, if I can remember, five years old and 12, thereabouts, maybe 11. And that's when I met my second husband and we decided to blend our families. So I think a lot of that is the fact that you were so young, you were new to this parenting thing. And I knew by being a parent that I had to find a way for this family to work. And so that it wasn't a disaster, it wasn't combative. And the way I had been raising my children at that point was the way I could wanted to continue to raise now my three new children. And we did not have any children between us. So two are mine and three are my husband's and we thought five was a good round number. So we would not increase that load by having more kids. And to our good fortune, our kids got together when they got together, they really liked each other from the beginning. I am eternally grateful for that because a lot of times that is not the case. Absolutely. Is that because of the way we introduced everyone into the family, we talked about it, we had family meetings about it, very possibly, but still you might have a personality conflict. So, you know, and as you talk about perspective, I mean, that's huge. Huge. Yeah. Huge. And And so hard to see when you're in it in the moment, right? So perspective is one of those weird things that I'm always aware of my own perspective. It is often very hard to tune in and be aware of other people's perspectives. And definitely that's a skill. Once you are, (laughs) once you become aware of how to do that and how to practice that, it does become easier and it's, uh, but it's definitely a thing. And so to go back to the first question you asked me, as I was doing this soul searching of who was I? to be able to help this. Um, I was actually, I hired a business coach as a part of my coach training and they gave me a worksheet, which is a pretty common business exercise. You know, what are the things that people already ask you? What are the things that, you know, people have always come to you? And um, I realized as a part of doing this that, because I had segmented it in my life. These are the things that happened to me, Amy, as a person. And then over here is my life as a as a business type thing. But what I realized when I opened up my mind and began to really be open about it is that people were already asking me questions about this and had been for a very long time. And I think that one of the reasons is is that because I, this is my lived experience. I am a stepmom. I married someone who had been married before. People were ready to ask me about or share with me or just be open with me about the experiences because I, you know, my family is non-traditional in in a sense. And so I'm less likely to come back and be like, oh, well, you're doing it wrong. You know, that's the problem. And so when I realized that it was already a part of what people were reaching out, I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe it's time for me to learn how to do this so that I can do it well and really be able to, to help some people. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's, there's nothing easy about it. There's no guarantees about it. You are blending a family that's not just children, but also parents and parents from all kinds of different parenting backgrounds. And it's not an easy task. And sometimes it works for parents to be more standoffish. If you're the step parent, maybe you leave the parenting and all the consequences and discipline to their actual parent, because sometimes that can cause problems. And it's not easy. And then egos get in the way. And we can talk more about that because that's a game changer, you know, being able to put that ego aside. Your ego is not your friend in this situation. That's true. And I always remind people, or I offer, I will say, which is a kinder way to say this. I don't think that marriage is particularly easy when you back up and look at it. So I I don't know that a first marriage is a whole lot easier than, than a blended family marriage. And I have had plenty of struggles with my parents. So I always like offer that sometimes, you know, yeah, blended family life is challenging and being a step parent is challenging a hundred percent, but I can offer a thousand different stories of people who have plenty of challenges and hardships in their life that are not at all related to that scenario. And so from my point of view, so I back up to that view, I'm more ready to face my life and the challenges and the challenge and find solutions because I'm no longer putting myself in the center of this universe of this is happening to me because I am a step parent. Um, it's just happening. 
And what do I want to do with it? How do I want to live? How do I want to be? What kind of day do I want to have? How do I want to proceed forward? One of the examples I give of this, I have a very close friend who has um, an adult child who has um, brain tumors and is autistic. The whole, like, it's a very, very, very tough adulting situation. Has nothing to do with her marriages, anything like that. You know, it's just hard. And there are hard things and we do them every single day. And for me, I find that helpful. It doesn't always work for other people, but I find that helpful when I get stuck in that thing of, oh, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? What's wrong with me that I can't figure this out? I remember, oh, maybe this is not because of this particular thing. Maybe it just is. Your hard challenges are not the same as their hard challenges. You know, everybody has different challenges and different ways they view their challenges. I really believe that incorporating gratitude into your life and incorporating the ability to see the blessings in even the hardest situations, because I believe there are always blessings that can really change the way you view your day-to-day activities. And like you said, you know, you can wake up your eye, you can wake up, open your eyes and decide, you know what, another day, another miserable day at work, another, you can open your eyes and be grateful that you even opened your eyes because a lot of people don't. And you can say, okay, I'm going to make this day the best it can be. And I'm going to help whoever I can help make their day the best it can be. And it's a decision you have to make or you dwell on whatever you're dwelling on. It is. I, I have struggled to see that at various times in my life. And I say this with the full awareness that I have, I have a lot of wonderful things in my life um, and a lot of privilege and benefits. And there were several years where I really struggled with the amount of time I was driving Uh, my kids around. And it was hours of my day that I was driving my kids around and my stepkids. And it was in a phase of my, this sometimes happens in blended families. I was primary caretaker of young kids and I became the taxi for like the entire blended family. And I really, really was put out by the whole process and in a lot of anger and resentment. And I was trying to feel grateful for all the things that I did have, because it is truly helpful. But I would sit in my car and just say, oh, I'm so thankful I have a car and I am so thankful I have a nice car. I'm so thankful that I have, you know, a car with a radio. And it was like, it was a little, I felt ridiculous doing it. It did help a little bit, but it was, ah, I wish I wasn't in my car so much, you know, so it can be hard to, to see the blessings at times. I just want to, you know, it's, it's true. You know, it's absolutely profoundly transformative when you see all the things that we're grateful for. And it's also just very hard sometimes. And that is one of the reasons that I do think that is very helpful to have people like you and I and other helpers on on your side, right? Because we are not always very good at seeing the things that are in our life that we can be thankful for. When we are in the muck of the hardship of life, it's really hard to see where we're fortunate sometimes. And it's helpful to have people around who can lead us to see it without shoving it in our face because nothing feels worse. (laughs) <laughs> then the person, when your arms are deep into a sink full of dirty dishes and somebody says to you, well, aren't you blessed to have so many dishes? And you're like, not at this moment. No, I don't feel very blessed to have all of these dishes. Like, don't talk to me about that right now. That's not my mood. You know, right now I'm annoyed that I've you got an hour of dishes to do, or I've just realized, you know, that the laundry never ends in a family. Like, the realization that you come to as an adult where you realize there's literally never an end to the laundry is one of the most devastating adult realizations that I've ever had in my life. I was like, there's just no end. There's never an end. As long as I'm wearing clothes, there will be laundry. You know, it's like, okay, full stop. Exactly. But always be happy you're wearing clothes. (laughs) Right. No, exactly. But don't come into me in my laundry room after a vacation when I've got four suitcases full of clothes to wash and remind me of that because I'm going to close the door and tell you. Because then you'll throw a suitcase. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) But then also what's really helpful having someone like me or you is in this blended family scenario and dependent on how you're coming at it. Some step parents and parents come at it as when my children come to visit, that should be all fun time. They're only here for two days or whatever it is. I shouldn't bog them down with responsibilities. My view and has always been my view when my children come, any of them, all five of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, whatever they are, they still are coming home. They are not guests in my home. This is their home. And it's being 
their home. That did not sound like English. Whatever. Since it's their home, there are certain responsibilities that we have to the family and the home. And those responsibilities are clean, keeping it organized, doing our laundry, whatever responsibilities you have, that should not change just because either one, your children came home from their other parent's house or your stepchildren came home from their other parent's house. It's still their home. And parents get in a lot of trouble with their kids and they build a lot of resentment between birth children and stepchildren because they treat those other children differently. Yeah. They treat them as guests. They treat them as just visiting. And it causes huge resentment, not to mention the children you're treating as guests. They're not guests. They're your children. Right. Hey, anyway, I, I go on about that. But so, yeah, I mean, I will offer because I don't know the total audience of, of what you're listening. I have actually seen a couple of examples where that does lend itself to a very successful relationship. And I'll give you a framework for where where I've seen that it doesn't adjust. It's mostly when the children in the blended family are significantly older, right? So you've got a family blending where the, the stepkids are already adults or young adults or teenagers, right? They've got an existing relationship with both of their biological parents and the step parent is meeting young adult. That's a little different than when you've got a step parent who's meeting a young parent. And so in that case, sometimes it is, it takes a little while to formulate it. And that relationship between the new parent, the new spouse and the adult child is almost like an extended family relationship. And the tools of developing that relationship fit very well into sort of a guest context. It is a family context, but it's it, the step parent can sometimes be struggling to understand what their role is with an adult stepchild that they just meet when they're 17 or 18, right? Should they call me mom? Should I be parenting them? Should they feel a connection to me? How do I develop this relationship? And if you take a step back, sometimes the start of that relationship is, oh, you know what, what if I think of this the same way I would a sister-in-law or a new cousin through marriage or so on and so forth. And it is, they do kind of feel like a house guest when they come over because they're adults, right? right. And everything you said is actually true, is absolutely true, right? Within the house framework, right, of the person who is remarried, there are house rules in that house. You don't, if you come over as a guest, you hopefully do not throw your stuff all over the place and not clean up after yourself, right? There are always house rules, right? But how we approach it is definitely different for a two-year-old or a four-year-old or a seven-year-old than we might if you are an adult. And one of the stories I tell is that I was having a conversation with somebody who was struggling to call his father's new wife stepmom. And as we talked about it, I realized that his mom had died. He's 45, right? And this is his husband, his father's new wife. And so then I said, well, has she ever asked you to call you the stepmom? And he's like, no, we've never had this conversation. I don't know. I feel awkward about it. And then I just said, I said, okay, well, maybe this is a thing you could talk to your mom. I mean, your dad and his new wife about just find out because in that context, she's perhaps just your dad's wife. Exactly. And that's what I was going to bring up. That's where conversation comes in. Sit down and talk and, and have a discussion. How would you like to call me? What would you like to call me? What would you like me to call you? How would you like our relationship to be? I'd love to get to know you. And sometimes a step parent in various situations is the same age as a grown child, depending on what the scenario is. And then there you go. You have like an actual peer. Yes. Who is now in the parenting role. So are they going to stay in the parenting role or they are going to be more of a, a companion, a friend, a, a confidant, maybe. Yep. What is that role? And that's where conversation comes in. You need to have conversation. You need not to assume. You need to actually ask the rest of the members of that family, how would you like this to look like? What would you like it to look like? What are you thinking? You can call me mom. You can call me Celia. You can call me whatever you want. I want to know what you're comfortable with because I'm yep. not going to invade your ability to get comfortable with this situation by demanding certain things and by telling certain things and not asking. Yeah. And those conversations, the first few times and maybe forever can feel a little strange until, and that's one of the things that there are, there are lots of frameworks. I'm sure you use them. You offer to your clients plans, ways to strategize these conversations and feel more confident when you go into them. 
Another place where that identity conversation comes up in families, which is a little less loaded and easier to conceptualize if people have never thought about it, right, is the, the grandparent title, right? So very similar to a blended family, when you've got grandparents, a lot of times you've got more than one person who's in a similar role. You've got more than one person who could be using the, or the title or the great grandma title, right? And so this is a place where grandparents frequently will be influenced, will choose their own name right? And they'll think about it. Also, sometimes grandparents uh, don't feel like they're ready to have that title, right? You maybe have a little age issue. You're like, ah, oh, how can I be a grandparent? You know, I was a very young grandparent because I was so young when I married somebody who already had kids. And I loved it. I loved that it was a conversation stopper that I was like, yeah, I'm a grandma. And people are like, what? How is that possible? But, <laughs> um, but some people don't love it. And that's totally fine. So they choose, you know, their own name. Um, and then they have that conversation. And I throw that out there because one of the things that I think that can be really helpful is that if you feel marginalized, if you feel excluded, if you feel like an outsider, if you feel like because you are in this blended family, you are somehow outside of the circle and unusual, sometimes it's really helpful to have somebody show you, oh, here's another place where this situation shows up. Right. So it's like, it's okay to have this conversation about what do you want to call me? Um, and that's actually a conversation that I didn't have. They always just call me my name. And I never like I said, I, I'm always upfront with people that I went you know, proceeding through this with absolutely no idea what I was doing, which sometimes I fell into wonderful things that worked out. Um, like this is one of them. I didn't have a preconception of what anybody should call me. So there wasn't an issue. Um, and there are other times where I totally stepped right into the doo-doo and had to work my way up. And, and I agree, like my kids all call me by my name, actually. They even made up a name and they call me by that name. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it was, it's they, love it. And it wasn't grandma, but it was just my, my, my children themselves, not my grandchildren made up a name, long story. And I'm not going to put it out there in podcast land because I want you guys to call me by my name. But, yeah. <laughs> but they rename me and they call me that name. They call me Celia and it's a good name. I mean, it's a person's name. It's not like derogatory or anything, but they will also call me mom occasionally. Now, when my oldest stepson came to live with us in eighth grade permanently, he did call me mom, but I never required any of them to call me mom. They have a mom. Yes. I, you know, yeah. yes, I'm in the mother role. But they only had to call me Celia and they call me Celia to this day. My grandmother name, Gammon, was created by my oldest grandson at that time, because now I have an older grandchild from a marriage of one of my stepchildren. He is technically my stepson's child, but I adore them nonetheless. And he couldn't say grandma and he, caught, he came up with Gammon, which was just his version of grandma. And it stuck because I really like it because like I'm an alien from Xenon, which I kind of am, but we like that name. I like that. Yeah, Gammon. it works. And I so love it. everybody calls me Gammon. And it's so all kinds of names get created in different 100%. ways. And that's, it's a great story, you know, that relates to step parenting. Yes, Absolutely. I think one of the difficult things for me as a step parent, and I know for other step parents that are very involved with their stepchildren, one of the difficulties for me was to know that even though I was so involved with my stepchildren and I was the one in our home that did a lot of the parenting and consequences and I was there at school meetings. I was there to pick them up. I was there when things went wrong and there were other meetings that had to be dealt with drug meetings and police meetings and, you know, yep. some things because things go wrong. Things go and wrong. And there are, are times where it's all right. adults on deck. Exactly. <laughs> and, but the hard thing is as a step parent, and it was hard for me, is to know that I had no legal rights. Yep. to that child as a step parent. And here I am the parent that is going through what he needed in police, drug, all of that. But yet, if yeah. anything needed to be signed, talked about anything, it was their two parents that were not getting involved. Yeah, and it so that's really a difficult situation, but it's one I understood. That's the law. And, and you have law. to Instead of getting frustrated about it, doesn't mean it's not challenging, doesn't mean it's not 
in its own little way disappointing that you have no say over this child when there are two actual active parents. Yes. It's still, it's still hard. It's still difficult. And I think that's one of the things we're talking about is there is stuff that's just plain difficult. Yes. And that definitely is. And in some complicated family situations, that is a, a really big situation that is going on. Byron Katie has that famous saying that's like, you know, you can fight with reality all you want and you're going to lose 100% of the time. And Don't you love that woman. Let me just I say. Do. I do. I love and Byron Katie. Exactly. And listeners, if you have not discovered Byron Katie, yeah. look her up because she's fabulous. Exactly. Right. So, you know, you know, a step parent does not have, in most cases, right, a legal guardianship over the child, right? And there are times when that's not true. And, and every family is totally different. Every family is totally different. And for me, what is helpful is that once I get to the point where I accept that, I accept that, and it doesn't have to be that, it can be anything, like this is, this is, is, like this is, is, then I hopefully stop pushing against it because sometimes we get lost in that resistance of, I don't want this to be the way it is. And when we, when we're in that spot of, I just don't want this to be the way it is. Like another place that this shows up is fighting with our kids. Like we will get lost in fighting with people because we don't want to be fighting with people. And as long as we're lost there and pushing into it, we can't step back and do the things that it takes to change the situation. So it is, it is really hard. And there are your, in, in the situations that you were in, your, you were going to do that for them, no matter what it's, it's what you were doing. Exactly. And we do things for people who are not our children all the time when they need us. Right. And children, you know, when they need us, uh, you know, we, strangers, right. Like, like that's, that's a reality of who it is. And people, children who are in need, I guess where I'm going with, wouldn't it be a wonderful place if every time our children needed us, any child on the planet, there was an adult nearby that stepped up and stepped in and did the things that would help them. Yes. And so if we shift to that, it's like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to step in and stand here for my kid, my stepkid, my neighbor's kid, the kid down the block, not intrusively when it's not your job, but when they need, right. Then, you know, I'm doing that for myself because this is what I want to do. And this kid has needs me right now. And I'm the adult. I'm the adult and I have the tools to do it. So that's a, you know, we call that a mindset shift, like a reframe, right? right? That's the mindset shift that I offer people when they're in that spot of they don't have any um, legal responsibility. And I just want to also say that like, there are times where <laughs> people don't ask too much. Like when you're on vacation with your stepkids and they get the flu and you go into urgent care, people don't really ask. Like you're the adult that's nearby. Nobody really sometimes asks like, Hey, who are you? You know, it's like this. Yeah, kid is sick usually and, you know, it's because someone offers the information. Yes. Right, exactly. And if your name, your last name is the same as your stepchildren's name as mine is. Then yeah, mine is too. That is, but then my name is different than my own children's name. My last yeah. name is not the same as their name because of the remarriage. But it's true what you say. And it goes back to my work to get people to understand that although you are not in control of everything that happens around you, you are always in control of the way you respond and react to it. Yeah. So sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so and like, it's hard. You know, it can it's be like really I hard to talk to people like when they say, and, and this is like, it goes into deeper work, but when they'll be like, oh, but my stepkids make me so mad. Oh yeah. And I will talk to my clients and I'll be like, they can't make you mad. Oh yeah, but they that's actually a big jump. cannot make you. It is. It's, yeah. it's involved work. Yeah, they the can day make you realize you that, it's feel like, mad. Oh. They can create yeah. a situation. This goes for any child yeah. that can get you irritated or upset, but you are in control of that. It's oh, the yeah. same thing if your kids ever walk up to you and say, "I'm bored." Actually, my my two grandkids were here for two weeks. And Logan walked up and he's like, you know, you know, Gammon, I'm just bored. And I looked at him, I raised my eyebrows because they know exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> and he looked at me and goes, I know, I know. I said, I know. So who's making you bored? And he goes, yeah. I am. I know I'm making you bored because nobody can make someone bored. No, absolutely. You are not responsible yeah. for your children's entertainment 24 seven. If, no. if you didn't know that before, know it now. That is not your yeah. responsibility. 
No. And for me as a person, honestly, one of the biggest changes uh, that I've gone through as an adult, um, and it's a lesson that I learn over and over again. I'm not going to say I'm perfect with this. I would never say that, but that is that I, only I am in charge of not just anger, but all of my emotions, right? And when when I, you know, it can be really hard. I don't know that there's anybody that doesn't screw this up sometimes, right? Somebody, a stranger walks up and, you know, punches you in the nose, like it, you react, right? You react, but it's hard to see the distinction that you are still in control of that and responsible for that. And it, the first time somebody presents that to, presented that to me, I have no idea when that was. But anyway, I remember feeling really victimized by it. What do you mean other people are not the cause of how I'm feeling and my emotions? Like, no, I, I need them to be in charge of these things because I don't know how to do it. And we need to blame somebody. Oh, yeah. Because it's not yeah, our responsibility. Right, right. I if want you wouldn't my stop that, fault. if you would stop it, I wouldn't yes. be so mad. Yes, exactly. If you would just stop being who you are. I want to be that. And then you spend all of your time trying to fix other people. And it's a process, right? It's a process. It's deep work. And so, yeah, realizing that I'm in control of my emotions and only I'm in control of my emotions. And that means so is everybody else. And then, you know, the next step is I can't actually do anything about to change the behavior of other people. Exactly. You can't. I really would like to sometimes. You can't. You can influence their behavior. Right. Yeah. You can work towards helping them deal with whatever situation they're dealing with. Yeah. But ultimately it's on them. And and that was best portrayed to the whole world gratefully and I was really kind of happy about it because it was right during the time that I was I had my international day of calm and the whole basis for it was the whole Will Smith Chris Rock debacle. You know that oh, was yeah. shown to the world. Here, Chris Rock was slapped in the face. Now he could have responded with the same aggression. He could have punched him in the face. Many people do. Many, many, many people do. Here he was on national TV, international TV, and he responded with a laugh and made light of it and made a joke of it and moved on and totally kept himself under control, even though he'd just been slapped in the face. Yep. And that is a perfect example of how you cannot control what happens around you, but you can always control, albeit not easy, your yeah. response to it. And sometimes controlling your response is not like an immediate thing necessarily, right. depending on the moment, right? Like, cause when you're, you know, when things are really emotional, sometimes they, there's a part of this, like give yourself grace, right? And if you, if you react the wrong way, some of that is owning what you did, stepping back and so on and so forth, because, you know, we've all lived this, right? There are times where something is really, really emotional and you don't, we don't do the things we wish we could do, right? Because those reactions, sometimes in a heavy emotional reactions, it's like, it takes practice, right? The first time, and I do think this shows up in step-parent combinations like mine. I didn't have kids, right? When I started being a step-parent. So I didn't have any experience dealing day in, day out with interactions with young kids. And I had very unrealistic expectations of how, how kids old behaved. were your kids when you became their step -mom? So when I entered their life as the, the girlfriend, they were eight and four. And I was a little bit older when we got, they were a little bit older when we got married, but eight and four, which is young, right? And so I didn't quite know how to handle like just normal behavior. What I now know is normal behavior. And I didn't have the skill set that it takes to have a kid ask you 5,000 questions in a day for eight hours, nonstop, uh, want to play a boring game eight times in a row. I'm giving you friendly, non, you know, things, but also, you know, when kids come at you with aggression or, you know, whatever their attitude is and how to have the ability to be an adult and not get into the, I didn't have those skills, right? I didn't have those skills. And so I, that's, that, that's, I, that's where it shows up. I think in a step parent thing, like, and so as a, um, as you learn them and you practice them, you get sort of or automatic responses that are better than an urgent, you know, response. So it's not like you're thinking about it in the moment, you train yourself to do whatever it is to give you a chance to assess. Right. So, and I think a lot of adults have these like sort of code words that they, it's like everybody around you knows because she needs a minute, you know, it's like, okay. Or I think a famous one is like when moms will say, be asked to make a decision, adults will be asked to make a decision. And they're like, well, you know, maybe, and the kids will say, ah, that means no, you know, you're just buying time. 
right? You're buying time. And in conflict situations, you know, giving people a tool to be able to do that is, it, it, it's a way to stage it out. Cause it's, it's not like when somebody screams at you the first time, you're not my mom, that you automatically know what to do, right? You don't, you don't have any idea. You're like, well, all right, well, that's new. Like, what are we going to do here? Yeah. And you're often presented I, the scenario of a blended family is that you're presented with children that will very much be aggravated and angry and irritable because they're put in a situation that they had no part and did not be, None. did not ask to be put in. And very often as step parents and as parents, we forget that yes. we forget that these children are now in a situation where talk about not knowing how to, how to handle it. Here are their little underdeveloped brains yeah, they trying don't have to sort out like, well, what the heck happened here? A hundred percent. Why are mom and dad still together? Right. Why, Why do, do I, I have, have to, go to back leave and forth? mom and go yeah. visit dad? A hundred percent. They don't and have, and we want them to have a difficult situation. Yeah. And we want them to have the same skills that we have, which is not just, just not realistic most of the time. And it does show up in the way that stress shows up, right? The kids are irritable. The kids are frustrated. The kids. Hi, I'm Celia Kibler and I am the founder of the International Day of Calm. And I want to take a minute to tell you why I created the Day of Calm and why it is my intention to create this feeling of calm, happiness throughout the year, because if we don't do something to change our daily lives, how will we ever change future generations? How will we create the next generation of adults that are confident and that are self-reliant and that are intentional about their own behaviors if we don't take the time to show them and role model what it's like to be that kind of person. It's a fourfold mission. Number one is personal responsibility. Each person has to start taking responsibility for themselves, for their actions and reactions, to stop the ridicule, the judgment, the criticism, and start connecting compassionately. We are all role models to kids. We need to create intentional parents, parents that create a cooperative, respectful, happy home and create the family harmony that every family deserves and every child deserves. We need to have expressive education, education that allows a child to be curious and creative and finds learning fun. We need to make children safe. We need to have them know that their personal harm is not an everyday worry, that they're safe in their homes and in their schools. And these four initiatives combine to create a child that becomes the adult of the next generation who is confident, who is not recovering from their childhood, who is intentional compassionate, loving, kind, and willing to learn about other people and other ways and other values. Let's do this together. Join me for the International Day of Calm. Join me for the International Day of Calm Summit when you can learn how to do this. And let's start doing this, not just for one day on April 5th, but throughout the year. Isn't our world worth it? Isn't the next generation worth it? Go to dayofcom.org. They're under stress. Uh, it shows up at school because school is their community, their safe space. One of the really big things that I see happen in newly, do this can happen. It doesn't have to be blended. It can just be a divorced family, right? So the kid is beginning new to transition. The communication is stressed between the parents the, and the school system, like their homework and the things like that begin to fall apart. And it's really kind of a logistical issue, right? Like the backpack is not where it's supposed to be. The books are not where they're supposed to be, so on and so forth. And the parents are not talking to each other and the parents are not talking to the teacher. And the kid doesn't have the skills to tell the teacher that the reason they don't have their assignment is because they spent the last night at one parent's and there wasn't a book back. 
right? They don't have the skills to talk to the parent about it. They don't have the skills to talk to the teacher about it. And the teacher may or may not have the information, the awareness of the training to be like, Hey, little Susie, can you tell me why you didn't do your homework? Right. And, you know, give her the chance to say, I didn't have my book bag because I was at the house where my book bag wasn't or whatever the situation might be, which shows up in a drop in performance. And then the parents end up in the school for the meeting and the whole thing and so on and so forth. And that's one of the places that shows up. And all it is in the end is that we've got people who are in a tough situation, a lot of stress, and they don't have the skills or the tools and the communication and the awareness to get through it. Exactly. And a lot of parents don't talk about things because they're like, well, you know, kids are resilient. They, right. This was and like they the are. Big, the big thing going through COVID. Well, kids are resilient and they are to a point. Yeah. But it also creates a lot of other feelings in a child's life because they no longer feel safe and secure. And that comfort right. level is blown out the window. Yeah. And so that really affects them. And a lot of things happen like a client of mine with older kids where the stepmom and the older daughter is not getting along. And when we dove into it, we came to realize that when this stepmom moved into their home, they never even talked about it. Right. They never even, she just like came in and here's your new parent. Yeah. And a lot that would of be times- hard parents do that. Yes. And then they're like, well, you know, they're flexible. They'll figure it out. They're, you know, they're resilient. They'll do that. And the truth is that, you know, they just may not like the way it works out. You know, they're going to, they're going to find their own way. And I do think that this is definitely an area where people who are much smarter and much more talented than me are still doing research, the impact on these transitions with young kids, because if you're not looking for it, you don't necessarily know, but I'll give you an example of, because one of the things I do think that is underappreciated is how hard that transition between the two houses is for young kids. Right. Um, and just that awareness of, oh, this is hard for kids can sometimes help make it easier. So when real conflict in my new blended family was that whenever my oldest step in my my daughter would come over. I felt very uncomfortable in the situation. I felt like it was agitated and I felt like it was super weird. And I was really unhappy about the whole thing. And I was working with a therapist at the time and I was letting it all out and all of my, you know, what all the things that were going out and they listened and they took me through it and they said, wait, so this happens every single time and they had me go through it. And they helped me to see that This kid was going through a pattern every time she came over. Every time she came over, she was checking, would go through the whole house, checking to see what was the same and what was different. I was seeing that as like she was inspecting the house, like what was she doing, so on and so forth. What she was really doing was just transitioning. She was checking it out, like what is different, what is not. And so, and it wasn't about me at all. It wasn't even about the house. It was how she was processing. And it's usually fact. not about. Right. <laughs> no, hundred percent. Right. I agree with that. But that's so, and then we made a shift, which was when she came over, I was like, Hey, let's take some time and go through and see all the things that are different. Like, Hey, you know, if you want to see this, something we changed. And I gave her that time and actually participated in that. So one of it was the awareness, like, just like, don't be bothered by the fact that she's going to do this. Right. And the other part was that, you know, it just worked out that I would get like sometimes involved in it. Right. And do that. And so the awareness that it is hard, that she was going to have her own way to do it and that it wasn't about me. Those were the things that showed right. up. And I mean, I remind people with the transition, think about how hard it is to sleep in a hotel room when you travel. Like it's not your bed. It's not your pillow. Things are not where they were the night before and how great it feels to come back. And that really is kind of what these kids are doing, even if, you know, over time it will become their space, hopefully. Right. But especially in the beginning, you've got new beds, new furniture, new house, new things, all of these things. That's a massive shift. Or even not new things. You're now sleeping in someone else's room. Oh my gosh. Yes. hundred percent. So your child is now has this new stranger person. Yes. Sleeping in the room. And if you can teach yourself and your children the really important ability to recognize that this is not about you, don't take it personally. And that applies to about everything in life. You can have success with so many things. And one of the big things to remember is that your children, be it stepchildren or birth children, are human beings. Oh, yes. And when you just blend a family and you don't even give them the consideration of conversation to talk about it, how would you feel? How would you feel if you were like, okay, this is your new home, this is your new family, this is your new people? 
Da, 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 da. New person. How, how right. would you feel? You'd feel like whatever. No, it's not. Goodbye. I'm leaving. Right. Or, or like We've decided right. this is my new fa- family. Right. Right. I, Who do I tell yeah. that? I don't like this. Right. It's even like yeah. a sibling when people oh, get yeah. an, a new baby and they're like, oh, this is your new baby brother or sister and you will love him. Right. Let me tell you guys, no guarantees. <laughs> they're going to love that new sibling and certainly not off the bat because that baby is taking away all of their personal time with yep. you. They Same don't arrive with a with skateboard ready to play. Right. Yep. Same thing with stepchildren. Yep. Now the dynamic of this family that they have been used to is now different. There yeah. are new people involved. And it's as difficult for your children as it is for your stepchildren. And you just have to start seeing children as human beings. Yep. It's the key when people yell, you know, how, how am I able to stop people from yelling at their kids? Because I make them recognize the fact that if you went to a job and a person sat there and yelled at you all the time and bossed you around and told you to do this and told you to, how long would you stay at that job? Right. Probably not very long. You can quit. Children can't. Children can't quit. Yeah. Young children can't quit. And um, one of the things that shows up and your kids were a little older, but one of the things that does show up in a lot of blended families that is a struggle is that when you've got two families that are going back and forth and transitioning, when the kids become adolescents, they often have strong opinions about where they sleep and how often they want to switch. And that's a struggle that the parents go through because it it really is. It's a time where adults become aware of the fact that it's not really so in a, if you've got young kids, you think of it as this is my time with my kids. And as the kids get older, you're presented with the option to see or not that it's really that kid's time, right? This is their life. And they may not always want to sleep in a place where they stuff is not, you know, like they've got right. their favorite pillow at the other house and that's the desk that they like to do their stuff. And that's where they're building their mural or whatever. And that's a really tough transition as, um, as adult for sure. It, it is. It absolutely is. And my, my youngest was my youngest stepson was four when we blended our family and my son was five. And then my daughter's the oldest and it went up incrementally to her. She's now going to turn 40 this year, but it is. And, and sometimes they don't, you know, it was like when my husband and I got married, we had been together for a while. The kids all knew each other. They loved each other, but our youngest, which is his youngest would not take any pictures. Yeah. And there was, there was a situation with the hamburger it was actually kind of funny. And uh, we had gotten everybody hamburgers for lunch because they had to eat something fast. And he refused, our youngest refused to eat this hamburger. And so my husband ate the hamburger and he spent the entire wedding blaming his father for eating the hamburger. And that's why he was so mad when clearly that was not why he was mad. Right. It was because he felt uncomfortable with the whole marriage and everything like that. Yeah. Even as much as we prepared. So you have to understand that these guys have feelings and they have opinions about this and they have thoughts and they're scared or they're anxious yeah. or they're excited. And, you know, even with excitement can become overwhelmed. And there's a lot of stuff going on and you have to realize that they're little human beings they're little and human big beings. human beings. Right. And none of us are perfect, right? We just don't have any idea what we're doing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. like the greatest illusion of adulthood. Like I always thought that there would be this time where I would know all of the answers, but so far as I can figure out, right, that, that time has not really happened yet. Like, so, you know, you are like, I stepped into the role as a stepmom. That was very confusing. I was learning new things. And then I thought I had all this knowledge and I had my kids. I realized I didn't know anything about that. And that person, every time I feel like I've got it figured out, there's something new. As they get older, the situation changes. You figure out preschool, you got to go to kindergarten. You can figure out kindergarten, you go to high, middle school, you figure out middle school, you go to high school. And then the greatest joke on us is that, you know, once you think you got it figured out, each of these kids is a little bit different and they do different things. So you Absolutely. never quite get it figured out. It's like every day you're like, well, all right, what do why? we do now? Because they're humans. <laughs> and I mean, that's part of the reason why you really need to put a parenting system in place yeah. in your home. Yeah. You have to have a system. So that you're not always flying by the seat of your pants. Yeah, and, 100%. And these stages and these phases don't totally knock you off your stool. Yes. You know, like, oh, well, here we go. I don't have a clue what to do with this. Right. You know, and why it's good to get help with someone like me, someone like you to guide you 
so that you do have a system in place and you do go at things proactively and intentionally. And sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Right. And sometimes your intention is not what you wanted it to be. So once again, you have to give yourself grace, but the road is hugely rewarding. It is not easy. Right. And, but the hard work can really pay off. A hundred percent. Pay off if you're willing. Yeah, I think so. And I'm thrilled to be, have the chance to have this conversation with you because I do think that there's a shortage of this message within the step parent blended family community that it can be done, that there are tools and resources and that there is support. And, you know, there's, you know, so we're, we're the majority, I think. So, you know, we should be the loudest getting that way. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So Amy, thank you so much. I am really grateful for this conversation as well. And we could probably go on forever, but uh, you know, I'm assuming our listeners have something to do with their life besides <laughs> just Maybe. listen. Not that I'm not grateful that they're not here. And I really am grateful that you guys are here listening, but we are going to also give you, you know, the ability to go and, you know, do whatever's on your menu for today. But if you know another family that's struggling, we ask that you share this to them. And hopefully you guys got one or two valuable pieces of advice that you can incorporate into your own family. So Amy, if you would, please tell our listeners how they can reach out to you, how they can find you. You betcha. All right. So my name is Amy Stone, which we said at the beginning, Uh, the name of my business is Amy Says So, which is after that parental thing because I say so. So Amy says so.com is my website. And that is the best place to start getting in touch with me. That's where I put the resources that are there to step you into my community of what life coaching is and how life coaching can help in the role of a blended family. And then I'm also, of course, I'm on social media because it's a rule these days. So I am, of course, on Facebook and on Instagram, if that is your preferred way to do it. And so that's Amy Says So Coaching. So that is the best way to get in touch with me. And I would love to hear from you if you think I can help. And I'm really grateful for what you do with parents. Guys, I think the ultimate message is if you are struggling Do not blame yourself. Do not be hard on yourself. Do not give up. Reach out for help. I'm here to help families of all kinds, including blended families. Amy's here with her life coaching to help you in all situations, including blended families. Reach out. It is a sign of courage to recognize that, you know what? I probably can get through this, but I need some help. And then when you have those tools in place, Here's the wonderful thing. You can go on. None of us are like, you have to work with me for the rest of your life. Oh, 100%. The whole goal is that you, we share with you these methods and these frameworks, you employ them into your life and you experience the magic of having these tools, which sometimes it really does feel magical, especially exactly. if, you've got, if you've got toddlers, when you have somebody who gives you a tool for working with a toddler, that does feel like magic. It really it does. does. And, um, and then you've got it and you run with it. Your life yep. is better. I've had clients say it's more than once say to me, oh my gosh, Celia, it was like magic. Yeah. Like you told me to do this. I did this and he did that. You right. know? And it was like, <laughs> I didn't so think it, it would work, but it, it is, did. Right. <laughs> I don't want to tell you this, Celia, but I didn't believe you when you told me to try it. Exactly. I was like, I'm desperate. I'm going to try it. And then I was like, I'm going to go for anything. Yeah. And and if you're the type of person that thinks, I don't know, that it's not going to work for me because I've tried everything. I know both of us have heard that. But if you've really tried everything, and I mean, that means you stay consistent with it, whether it's failing or it's working, and you're really making an effort to make this work then maybe that one thing didn't work out. But if you've literally tried everything and everything is still falling apart, I just want to give you a clue that you haven't tried everything. And and just like Amy said, we can learn something new every day. We're never at the maximum of learning. Right. And we, it's also sometimes, I don't know if you help people with this, but sometimes it's helped to make the decision of what is the next thing I want to do, because that can be hard to see. You know, it's like, I've tried everything and you're stuck. That comes down to the skill of making a decision. What are the choices I have here that I see? And what is the decision I want to make and why? Because 
we all make hard decisions every day. What sandwich do I want for lunch? That can be a very hard decision. What outfit am I going to wear to, you know, this event, you know, but, you know, whatever I'm making light of it, but we all make decisions every day. It can be when we are in alignment with that decision, it feels sometimes a little help is what we need. Yes, exactly. So reach out. Well, Amy, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was great fun. My pleasure. And to all of you listeners, reach out to Amy. I will put her information on the description of this podcast. Reach out to me. Reach out, whether it's not even us, it's someone else. Reach out, get the help you need. You will be so grateful that you did. Honestly, you will be so grateful that you did. And remember that not everything is for everybody. So find what works for you. And as always, guys, I'm grateful that you spent some time hanging out with us. Please share this out if you know someone this could help. And as always, I wish you days filled with peace, love, tons of laughter. It really is the best medicine. Laugh a lot. Stuff is funny. And I'll see you here next time on the Pumped Up Parenting Podcast. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Pumped Up Parenting Podcast. If this episode was helpful to you, please share it with a friend and leave us a review that will help others. Wonder why kids don't come with a manual? Well, wonder no more because I wrote you one and it's just won a wonderful Mom's Choice Award. Go to celiasbooks.com and buy your copy of Raising Happy Toddlers, as well as my children's books. I appreciate you being part of my mission to help 10 million parents stop yelling at their kids. Please be intentional and hug on those kids of yours. See you at the next episode.